Part 5, Section 2, Chapter 29 of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 29, The American Pulpit. The American pulpit has occupied a large place in the religious history of the country. The first preachers were men of remarkable gifts. Thoroughly educated, for the most part in Cambridge, England, devoted to Bible study and to the investigation of the severest theological problems, active in temporal affairs, the first ministers of the colonies made their influence felt on the whole life of the country. This was particularly true of New England, where the clergy had a fair field. They were the real founders of the New England commonwealths. In their fast day and Thanksgiving day discourses, they discussed public questions with great ability and perfect frankness. The legislators derived their best advice from the ministers, who never avoided the full and just treatment of great public questions. They were the chief promoters of every educational movement. They founded the early colleges. They knew their power. They magnified their office. No Stuart King was reverenced more by ardent loyalist than the New England minister by his flock. But in this case no men were more worthy of that reverence. As Professor Moses Coit Taylor says, quote, For once in the history of the world the sovereign power was in the hands of sovereign men. End quote. In holiness of life, in intellectual breadth and acuteness, in devotion to their calling, they were a body of men unsurpassed in the history of the founding of great commonwealths. Their support was often scanty, a piece of land and a few hundred dollars. They were often paid in produce. Poor in all things except the wealth of brains and faith, the preachers of the colonial period of America have made many rich. The New England sermon, until quite a late period, was a magnificent specimen of intellectual athletics. The deepest problems of religion were ventilated with a completeness and logical thoroughness of which the preaching at this age can give us but little conception. If one sermon was insufficient for this purpose, the subject was continued the next Sunday. Indeed, it might run through the year or the years. Doctrinal preaching was largely in vogue, abstract points of metaphysical theology were then living questions in which the people were intensely interested mrs harriet beecher stowe as one to the manner born has interpreted the new england mind in her minister's wooing she there represents the men and matrons of the age succeeding the revolution as discussing over their work the theology of the long abstruse sermons of the preceding sabbath they entered into these debates with keen relish. The pulpit was the sole fountain of popular instruction. Happily enough, it was not then confronted with the many rivals which now contest its influence. The preachers rose to their opportunities, and from their high vantage ground they spoke with power and authority. They were the uncrowned kings of the age. The pulpit was the only throne known to the colonies. In the past more than today, the American clergy have been the leaders in all movements for liberty and the better time. In the war for independence, they thundered from their pulpits against English oppression, and aroused the people to enthusiasm. Both in the North and South, the clergy were heroes on the field and in council, and were among the first to foresee the necessity of revolution and the sublime destiny of the country without the clergy of that critical time the independence of the united states could not have been achieved the same fact appears in the civil war of eighteen sixty one to sixty five in the gradual development of the spirit of emancipation of the slaves the clergy performed their full share many of them indeed were conservative and took no active part in the discussions others spoke out boldly Samuel Hopkins, in Newport, lifted up his voice against the slave trade, then actively conducted by New England dealers. He was fierce in his attacks, 
even though some members of his congregation were engaged in the business he devised a scheme of colonization by which he hoped to solve the problem theodore parker was a mighty champion in the same cause henry ward beecher told the members of his church in brooklyn on becoming their pastor that he expected to wage war against slavery and that he desired a free field many less influential were no less outspoken the temperance reform has called out the earnest efforts of the clergy justin edwards devoted his life to this cause hitchcock at amherst and beecher at litchfield were sturdy champions if to some the ministry did not move fast enough along lines of reform it can be said that the adherence of the clergy has made this and every other beneficent movement possible many of the american clergy have been famous for the quickening power of their preaching great revivals and organized movements have been prompted by their appeals edward n kirk of the mount vernon congregational church boston exercised a most fruitful ministry asahel nettleton was active as an evangelist in massachusetts connecticut and new york from eighteen twelve to eighteen twenty two he was a strong calvinist and vigorously opposed the methods and doctrines of finney finney himself labored with marvelous success in evangelistic work from eighteen twenty four to eighteen sixty even after his installation as professor at oberlin in eighteen thirty five he traveled through the country on his revival mission he used simple language was clear logical and direct in his presentation of the truth he analyzed the motives with a master hand and his appeals to the conscience were overwhelming both his preaching and methods were similar to those already employed by the methodists and for a time he was bitterly opposed by some congregational and presbyterian ministers these conservatives held a convention in new lebanon new hampshire to decide what to do concerning finney's innovations lyman beecher though progressive enough in some matters was among finney's opponents beecher was a powerful preacher and his own labors were not without permanent results in the quickening of the churches benjamin abbott carried on a marvelous ministry in new jersey in the second and third decades of the nineteenth century he was the founder of many methodist churches in that state peter cartwright the methodist pioneer in the west was a man of original mold with a strong dash of eccentricity the preaching of him and of many of his co-laborers was attended with remarkable demonstrations the days of pentecost were repeated cartwright received over ten thousand people into the church the revue des du mondes in a full treatment of his career has presented cartwright's work as a type of the pioneer religious life of the united states his life reads like a romance recently under moody and other evangelists revivals on a large scale have been witnessed many eminent preachers have shed honor upon the american church in no field of our ecclesiastical life has there been reaped a richer or more enduring harvest in these later times the following among others deserve mention edward payson was a man of preeminent holiness and purity of character he was the pastor of the second congregational church of portland maine from eighteen o seven until his death in eighteen twenty seven it has been said that his life and sermons have been quote, more read at home and abroad than the writings of any other new england divine except timothy dwight end quote. john summerfield was an englishman who in eighteen twenty one entered the methodist ministry in new york his career was brief but it was one of remarkable brilliancy and success he drew vast crowds by his astonishing eloquence henry b bascom of the methodist episcopal church south who died in louisville in eighteen fifty had a national reputation as a preacher horace bushnell of hartford died eighteen seventy six was the frederick william robertson of america 
his sermons were bold and original and remarkably suggestive in their unfolding and application of spiritual truth henry ward beecher was an important name in the history of american preaching he was the son of lyman beecher and began his ministry at lawrenceburg indiana in 1837 whence in two years he was called to indianapolis from 1847 until his death march 8 1887 he was the pastor of plymouth church brooklyn where he achieved a world-wide reputation his frankness and unconventionality his warm human sympathies and his intrepid advocacy of every moral reform his marvelous insight into certain aspects of the gospel and of the character of christ the sweep of his imagination and his splendid oratorical gifts all these things gave him a phenomenal success as a preacher he cared nothing for theology as a system indeed he had little theological ability his mind was not logical and constructive but intuitional he had a great heart and the supreme object of his ministry was human helpfulness his long ministry of forty years in brooklyn is the most famous perhaps in the annals of church history it may be fitly compared because of fervid eloquence combative force against popular errors and lengthy continuance to the immortal career of chrysostom in antioch and constantinople matthew simpson was one of the most powerful and magnetic preachers of the american church with a vivid imagination a far-reaching and melodious voice a keen perception of the very central truths of the gospel an intense sympathy with the masses and a powerful and subtle grasp of the need of great reforms he long stood as leader of the methodist episcopal church in council on the platform and in the pulpit in lofty and overpowering speech bishop simpson takes just rank among the most eloquent preachers of the anglo-saxon pulpit many other names occur in the history of american preaching james l hawkes john mcclintock thomas gard william adams john p thompson edwin h chapin william r williams george w bethune thomas starr king james freeman clark otis h tiffany these names represent many more who have shown that in the matter of preaching the United States has been behind no country in the world. End of chapter 29